Hi, I'm Michael Palmer. I'm a second year graduate student here at the Strawberry Center, and I'll be talking about host resistance to powdery mildew, as well as fungicide resistance development in powdery mildew. With that, I wanted to thank you all for joining today, and we'll go right ahead and hop into the presentation here. Just a quick outline of the presentation. We'll begin by talking about the fungicide resistance trial, and then we'll move on to discussing the host resistance trials. So fungicide resistance. The fungicide assay starts when I get a sample, and so I either go out and collect this sample myself, or I get it from a PCA, or from someone at the commission, and it's always some sort of infected plant material, whether that be uh, leaves or berries. And uh, if it's all from the same field, then I label it as a single isolate for the fungicide assay. Then once I get this sample, I go out into our fields at the center and I collect folded Monterey leaflets. And it's important that they're folded because that's when they're most susceptible to mildew infection. And then I go ahead and I take those leaflets and I sterilize them in bleach for three minutes to ensure that they're clean. And I put them on this device called the Anderson Spore Cascader, which is essentially a vacuum with perforated plates that allows me to distribute the spores evenly onto the clean leaflets. And I then brush the sample through the cascader onto the clean leaflets. And this is just to standardize the amount of inoculum because when I get this sample, I have no idea how old some of the mildew is or how dense it is. And so this helps me have a standard amount of inoculum for the fungicide assay. I then take those inoculated leaflets and put them in a growth chamber at 20 degrees Celsius in 16 hours light, 8 hours dark. And then after 14 days, when that inoculum is built up, I'm able to go collect more clean leaflets and treat them with fungicide. So here I am taking newly collected and sterilized Monterey leaflets and dipping them in their assigned fungicide treatment. These are the six treatments used in the fungicide assay. The frac codes represent the mode of action of each product, and so products that share the same frac code have the same mode of action or way of controlling the fungus. And the six treatments were selected to represent a diversity of frac codes. Each treatment was applied at the minimum labeled rate to highlight resistance in any of the isolates. And each treatment consisted of three reps, and one rep was defined as three treated leaflets on a single plate of auger. And then when I have these treated leaves, I put them in the Anderson spore cascader, and then I take those previously inoculated leaves that have been incubating for 14 days, and I brush them onto the treated leaves. Now the treated leaves that have just been inoculated go into the growth chamber for 14 days at the same conditions, and after two weeks, they are evaluated for disease incidence. Here are a couple of representative plates of what the leaflets might look like after 14 days of incubation. On the left here, there is no disease on these leaflets versus on the right, all three of these leaflets are diseased. And so you can see those lesions inside the yellow circles. A plate like this on the right would be considered to have a disease incidence of 100%. The results here are expressed with disease incidence on the y-axis, and that's a percentage from 0 to 100. And then all the treatments are labeled on the x-axis. These will be the results for all 19 isolates uh, ran through the fungicide assay so far. The non-treated is the highest disease incidence as it should be, and then there is a range of incidence in the treatments. Fontellus had the highest disease incidence at over 50%, and then Quintec and Rally were somewhere around 40%, Torino and Flint somewhere in the high teens, and then Luna Sensation was under 5% disease incidence. And this, is, this chart shows all 19 isolates, the results from each individual isolate. I know it's a lot of data to take in. You can see the averages there at the bottom and it's the same significant letters. But what I really wanted to point out here was that 
there were two isolates from organic production systems and these isolates were entirely sensitive to every single treatment so it lines up well because in theory isolates or mildew that has never been exposed to fungicides should be entirely sensitive to it and that is what was confirmed here with these two organic isolates. In conclusion, I believe that powdery mildew in California is capable of developing resistance to fungicides and I think this is best supported by the significant differences in efficacy of the treatments when averaged over all 19 isolates as well as both isolates from organic production being sensitive to all the products as they have not been exposed to fungicides yet. Also, the product with two modes of action, Luna Sensation, worked best and this falls in line with recommendations from integrated pest management principles as well as the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee that in order to prevent fungicide resistance, multiple modes of action should be used. And now we'll move on to the host resistance trials. Three trials were performed to evaluate host resistance to powdery mildew. First was a winter trial done from January to February of this year at the Cal Poly Greenhouse. It evaluated 12 cultivars and each cultivar had four pots of four plants each. A summer trial was done in a similar fashion but from May to June of this year and it involved 16 cultivars and we dropped the two Driscoll's cultivars and included a couple more from UC and a couple from Lassen. And then finally, a field evaluation was done on the 10 shared cultivars between the winter and summer trials and we were fortunate enough to have all these cultivars out in our fields as part of the soil borne disease resistance trials. The plants for the greenhouse trials were first established in the hoop house at Cal Poly and they were planted in six inch pots and a mixture of peat, perlite, and coconut core and they were overhead irrigated with a shower nozzle on a garden hose for four to five weeks. After that time they were moved into the greenhouse where an active mildew epidemic was present on more mature plants and they were irrigated via spike emitters. This is what the plants looked like upon transfer into the greenhouse. They were all at the four to five leaf stage and before transfer, each plant was inspected to ensure that it was entirely free of mildew. Each plot was laid out in this two by two fashion as pictured here. And then in between each plot was an inoculum or spreader plant that already had either developed or developing lesions of mildew on it. And so after the transfer, we gave the plants 40 and 41 days in the winter and summer trials respectively to do the ratings. And the important rating here that you should pay attention to is the disease index. And so this was a score calculated from taking the percent of infected leaves per plot and multiplying it by the average severity of each of those infected leaves per plot. And then in the field, we also took disease severity, but instead of looking at each and every leaf, we took five symptomatic leaves from each plot. This is what the ratings looked like in the greenhouse. So I'm going through here and looking at each individual leaf, and if it has mildew present, I'm reading off the percent of the leaf that's colonized by mildew to someone writing down and recording the results behind me. Before I go ahead and show the data from the winter trial, I wanted to point out that on the y-axis we have disease index, and here that ranges from 0 to 25, and then on the x-axis we have all the cultivar names. So you can see there's quite a range of susceptibility between all the cultivars. Uh, on the most susceptible end we had BG 3.324 and Royal Royce, and in this trial these were far and away the most susceptible, at least double the susceptibility of all the other cultivars. And then on the least susceptible end, we had San Andreas and Sweet Anne. And so as I move through explaining the data from the summer trial and the field evaluation, I want you to pay attention to BG 3.324 and Sweet Anne as those are representative, highly susceptible and low susceptible cultivars. 
disease index was also used to rate the cultivars in the summer trial. However, it only goes from 0 to 12 in this trial as the susceptibility was generally lower. We still have VG 3.324 as the most susceptible and sweet Ann is on the less susceptible end. However, it is not the least susceptible in this trial of all the cultivars evaluated. You can see Fronteris here is actually the least susceptible. In the field evaluation, the cultivars were evaluated for average severity instead of disease index, but the relative differences are still the same. So again, 3.324 was the most susceptible and Sweet Ann was the least susceptible. So these relative differences mirror pretty well what was found in both the winter and summer trials. With the data from all three trials, I created a chart categorizing every cultivar into four levels of susceptibility, uh, one plus being the least susceptible and four being the most. So we have 3.324 and Royal Royce as the most susceptible and I included Royal Royce because in that winter trial it was so much above all the other cultivars up there with BG 3.324. And then on the least susceptible end we had San Andreas, Sweet Ann, and Fronteras. And then Finally, it's important to note that no cultivars showed full resistance, so there was always some mildew on every single cultivar in every single trial. Also, I wanted to point out here Monterey, because I know that's the most commonly grown cultivar in the state, and from talking to growers as well as PCAs, it's, I know it's generally considered to be susceptible, and although it does get mildew, it in these trials was not as susceptible as a lot of the other cultivars evaluated. All this work was not done alone, so I just wanted to acknowledge a few different groups. I wanted to say thank you to the Strawberry Commission for funding both of these projects. Thank you to Daniel, Miriam, Ignacio, and Mark for helping me collect all these samples for the fungicide assay. I know I pestered you guys a lot and I really appreciate it. And then Thank you to my committee for guidance in experimental design and presenting data. And then thank you to Kyle Blauer and Sam Faro for helping me set up the host resistance project. Again, I wanted to thank you all for your time. I'll be live now to answer some questions, or if you want to email or call me, I'm happy to respond to either.